In the mid-1960s, Ladislav Bittman was deputy director of the Czechoslovakian Intelligence Service Department of Disinformation. In 1968, after the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, he defected to the United States. Disinformation is actually a deliberately distorted or, or manipulated information that is uh, leaked into the communication system of the opponent with the expectation that it would be accepted as genuine information and uh, influence either the decision-making process, for example, or to influence or manipulate public opinion. Jean-Francois Revel was director of France's leading news magazine, L'Express, for a number of years. Today, he is the author of a long list of books on politics and philosophy. La disinformation, uh, ce n'est pas simplement le mensonge. Disinformation is not simply lies or falsifications. It is the art of having your enemies say what you want them to say. This consists in conditioning Western journalists by the USSR in such a way that in perfectly good faith, or sometimes for different reasons, even sometimes financial reasons, these journalists would write what the Soviet Union would like them to write. After which, TASS takes their text and says, you see, even the Western press is saying this. Active measures, and these go even further, consist in making up completely false documents which they try to have distributed as authentic Western documents. We have many famous examples, from the Fessler Report of 1952 to the so-called fake letter of Ronald Reagan to the King of Spain, Juan Carlos, in which Reagan said Spain must join NATO or else you will see what will happen to you. This was a fake. Both techniques have enormous importance in the strategy of mental destabilization of the West by the Soviet Union. Stanislav Levchenko is an expert in the field of Soviet active measures. In the middle 1970s, he was a major in the KGB, the Soviet Union's intelligence service. He formerly worked with a major Soviet front group. Afterwards, he was in the international department of the CPSU, which plans and oversees active measures for the Soviet Union internationally. Finally, he was chief of the active measures section of the KGB's office in Tokyo, using his cover and assignment as a correspondent. In 1979, he defected to the United States. At any given moment, uh, the uh, Soviets are involved in uh, active measures, measures all over the world and practically in any country of the world. Uh, the number of operations uh, which they are running uh, can be counted only in thousands. We're talking about uh, many thousands of people, probably somewhere at least, at least 15,000 people who in the Soviet Union and outside of the Soviet Union are involved in that kind of actions on regular and daily basis. On the very uh, top tip of the pyramid, is uh, the Soviet Politburo, uh, which uh, approves uh, the most uh, dramatic and large-scale global or regional active measures. But uh, daily uh, business in this field is being run by um, the International Department of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. International Department uh, is responsible for planning, coordination, and implementation of uh, uh, the Soviet active measures abroad. The main difference between overt and covert types of operation uh, in this field is that uh, when Soviets are running some clandestine active measures operation, uh, like for instance, uh, planting some major story in the newspaper, 
in France, West Germany, United States, elsewhere, Japan, elsewhere. Uh, that kind of article normally would be written by a local, in many cases, prominent journalist who, would, who will express, express as if his own or her own opinion. These kind of things normally won't be traceable back to the Soviet Union. About 40% of uh, the 40, 45% of the Soviet citizens stationed abroad are either KG, full-time KGB officers or uh, GRU military intelligence officers. Another 50% are cooperating either with KGB or GRU. So practically every Soviet citizen abroad uh, who is on official mission is involved in intelligence gathering information or active measures uh, uh, activity mm -hmm. one way or other. From 1964 un until 1966, uh, the Czechoslovak uh, service was involved in a number of operations, um, mainly against the United States, undermining uh, American foreign policy in Western Europe, in developing countries. And uh, at the time, the Czechoslovak television was thinking about making a documentary about Black and Devil's Lakes in uh, uh, Czechoslovakia, the Czechoslovak West German borders. And that actually brought the Czechoslovak disinformation department with the idea to use it uh, uh, to put something in, in one of the lakes, and that then the, the, the television would discover it. And uh, we actually prepared a mm, uh, series of documents for that purpose. Well, o originally we dropped four chests uh, at the bottom of the Black Lake. They were actually empty. There were no, no documents at that time because we still didn't have these documents. We were still searching for the documents. And then came the Czechoslovak television team and I was one of the divers. They didn't know that I was an intelligence officer. They thought that I was one of the uh, Czechoslovak uh, officials at Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So uh, I actually led the diving team to the area where these chests were uh, placed on the bottom and they were discovered. And the Czechoslovak Ministry of uh, Interior announced at a, at, a, at a special press conference that Historically important documents were discovered in that lake. And that was the beginning of the campaign that lasted for about two years. Uh, the, the purpose was to revive the threat of Nazism and to, sh to, to point a finger at West Germany and say, look, they are still there and West Germany is still a, a great potential danger for you. One of the major and most effective forms of disinformation is forgery. Letters, telegrams, memoranda are forged on a regular basis. Dr. Bittman explains. I would say that the major successes were in developing countries where uh, the, the governments didn't have the expertise to analyze properly these operations. And for example, sometimes in very cheap forgeries are accepted, anti-American forgeries, forgeries of American documents are accepted in developing countries as a genuine proof of American conspiracy. For example, the, um, in some ways the most damaging story of uh, one of these active measures of disinformation, and one almost uses the term interchangeably here, we've uh, occurred in Ghana in uh, the last day of March of 83, where the number two man in the government, uh, key advisor to uh, President Rawlings, got up, held a press conference, and uh, waved a document around and said, I have the proof. This document, a report of the West German Embassy of a conversation with the American ambassador, Thomas Smith, in which he explained how and why the Americans were going to overthrow the Rawlings government. Uh, this led to a uh, sharp deterioration of relations between the United States and Ghana. Uh, it took some time to uh, work that out. Eventually, the Ghanaians accepted our and the West German uh, explanations of why this was a fake document. Letters and telegrams are not the only forgeries. During this time, for example, the Czechoslovak and, and uh, East German intelligence, service, intelligence services started a worldwide campaign to undermine, uh, to paralyze the operations of CIA. 
And at that time, the East Germans came with the initiative to publish a book called Who is Who in CIA. Uh, the information came from Czechoslovak and East German archives, and of course under the Soviet supervision. It, was, it is a classical example of, uh, of a disinformation product. It, the book contains a number of names, supposedly CIA operatives, about 50% of the names of that book in that book are truly CIA agents, CIA operatives. And uh, then there is a number of names uh, of uh, various American diplomats, public officials, judges, uh, journalists who never worked for the CIA. There's one case, a uh, U.S. Army Field Manual, 3031B, uh, which is a goes back to the middle 70s and is supposed to be a manual on how to destabilize countries. Uh, this appeared has appeared in about 20 different countries. I do remember that uh, I myself on many I actually had to uh, uh, keep uh, white gloves in uh, one of the drawers of my desk because uh, time and again you know, when a diplomatic pouch will arrive and uh, uh, secret packages will be brought into my office, you know, almost each time there will be some forgery there. And, you know, like in spy movies, <laughs> sometimes spy movies <laughs> saying right things, uh, you, you are not supposed to leave any traces that somebody was uh, working on such documents. So sometimes for hours I had to read and to work on some uh, forgery wearing gloves. Another example um, took place uh, more recently uh, in Italy. Uh, as you know, the, uh, the Soviets and the Bulgarians have had uh, terrible publicity because of their possible implication in the assassination of the Pope, the arrest of Antonov, uh, the Bulgarian connection. Well, the, uh, there appeared in Rome, uh, in this, indeed, in, um, in this magazine, Pace Iguera, a, a, a story based on this was uh, July of 83, based on two telegrams, uh, supposedly written by the American Embassy in Rome uh, to Department of State, to Washington, proposing how the U.S. could take advantage of the papal assassination to orchestrate the press in Europe in such a way that the Soviets and the Bulgarians would be criticized. Uh, our embassy was asked for comment. Fortunately, they were on their toes and they were able to knock this down as two fake telegrams and show the press why they were fake and this effort didn't work. Now in the case, the case of the Rome telegrams, uh, there were a number of mistakes that were made. Uh, number one, uh, they forgot to put cable number on it. And all American embassy telegrams have a number on it, as you know, or USIA telegram. That was the first mistake. Second mistake, was in the address, addressee line in Washington. This was supposedly a suggestion from Embassy Rome to USIA in Washington. What the telegram said was USIS Washington. Well, no telegram would go out if it was a USIS telegram. You know, many mistakes civil servants, bureaucrats can make, but they get the name of their organization right. Forgery is only one type of active measure. Another is the Soviet front. Soviets also have uh, more than 60 years uh, of experience of running so-called Soviet fronts. Uh, by fronts, uh, they understand uh, uh, organizations uh, which uh, claim to be public, independent organizations, but actually they are being run uh, primarily by International Department of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. The most spectacular example is uh, uh, the World Peace Council, uh, which has headquarters in uh, Helsinki. And uh, uh, whatever World Peace Council does, uh, uh, each step of uh, leadership of World Peace Council uh, is approved or disapproved uh, by, uh, directly by, by, by Moscow. Uh, for example, uh, here in the United States, um, you remember 19, June of 1982, we had the largest demonstration uh, since the Vietnam War uh, up in New York on the nuclear issue. Well, in the steering committee that organized that demonstration, 
Uh, there were 28 members of that. Uh, of that 28, five were members of the Communist Party or members of the U.S. affiliate of the World Peace Council. The five were able to convince the, 20, the other 23. The real problem is with NATO missiles, and the focus is not on the, uh, not on the Eastern missiles. Uh, and so this was a, a, a further reinforcement for them of the line that they have been trying to push very, very hard. Another type of active measure is the agent of influence. Mr. Levchenko has first-hand knowledge of this activity. They use uh, practically any kind of, uh, and any type of uh, uh, actions to try to uh, get uh, people's cooperation, but uh, uh, normally uh, they uh, First of all, they're trying to recruit uh, so-called agents of influence. Uh, without agents of influence, uh, Soviets uh, will, never, will never be able to implement any uh, active measures at all. The most recent classic example came in West Germany, where the special assistant to Willy Brandt turned out to be an East German spy. In many cases, uh, agent of influence uh, is not used for collection of intelligence. But... Uh, he is supposed to be able uh, to influence public opinion or business circles or government circles uh, or public organization in his country, one way or other. For instance, in Japan, uh, uh, the most important Soviet agent of influence uh, was basically recruited because of his ego problems. Uh, by the time Soviets approached him, he already at least one time was a member of the uh, Japanese government. He started to publish monthly bulletin, and uh, he started to exchange the delegations between the Japanese parliament and the parliamentarians and, 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 and Soviet parliamentarians. That's exactly also what Soviets wanted. And Soviets were using him to plant all kinds of uh, disinformation. One technique of active measures that often remains undetected is the use of rumors. For example, uh, at the time of the tragedy in the mosque in Mecca, the, Ho the Holy Mosque in, in Mecca, 1979, when it was attacked, uh, Soviet diplomats throughout the Middle East were spreading the story that the United States CIA was behind it. Uh, and uh, indeed, in, at the time, uh, there was a, a, a test match, a cricket match, between India and Pakistan uh, taking place. And one of the broadcasters on that, uh, in that cricket match, test match, which is listened to all over India and Pakistan, you know, sort of like the American World Series or a uh, football championship, uh, mentioned on the radio uh, this report, that he had heard a report that the United States was behind the attack of the mosque in Mecca. And as you know, that the next day, the United States Embassy in Islamabad was attacked and burned. Some questions remain unanswered. What is the effect of all these active measures? And why do the Soviets engage in these activities? Of course, we cannot, uh, they are not uh, so naive uh, to, to think that one successful disinformation operation can totally change the balance of power. Uh, but they believe that these operations have cumulative effect. One way of looking at the impact of these activities, and they've gone on for many, many years, uh, since the, uh, the 1950s, uh, so that you're, you're speaking of 30 or so years of such activities, is to think of drops of water falling on a stone. Five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, one hour, one day, nothing happens. But five years, 10 years, 15 years, you've worn a hole in the stone. You know, it's very hard for journalists to accept that this has been going on, because otherwise they have to admit almost in the same breath that they've been ripping off their readers and viewers and listeners. It's very hard to do. It's very important to educate people about these techniques. 
and I would say particularly people who are involved in international relations, international communication, in, uh, uh, reporting foreign affairs, to make them aware of the basic elementary techniques of disinformation and active measures so that they develop certain protective devices so it makes it more difficult for for the Soviets to misuse these people because in many cases uh, the messengers even don't know that they are misused. Si, donc, les démocraties ne reprennent pas confiance. If the democracies don't regain their self-confidence, I am very pessimistic because the Soviet Union is extremely skilled in its propaganda techniques. So I think that the reality of our future lies in what I would call the reconquest of the truth.